This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. This is the Fast Break Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. Alongside me, as always, is Dave Oster. What's up, what's up? And Ricky Wimmer sick. So he is not joining us today. We have a great show for you nonetheless. Dave was out. Um, he was working during uh, Ricky and I's, uh, you know, little... Yeah, I uh, wish I could have been there with you guys. Fun segments talking about DeMarcus Cousins and Paul George. But we still have, uh, you know, a lot to talk about. Free Always tons to talk about. Still running along. Today we're going to be talking about Carmelo Anthony. The Thunder are planning on trading him or buying him out before the season is over. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about the Pacers and the moves they've made so far in the offseason and what we think they can do in the Eastern Conference. And finally, we'll wrap it up with some Summer League talk. So we'll talk about all the kids that have been going off in the Summer League. Guys we've liked, guys we haven't liked. And we'll talk about that all in one little segment. But before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Don't forget to check out mostvaluablepodcast.com so you don't miss any of the segments or full podcasts we put up. Also, since you're there, we have the store button. So if you want to buy an MVP t-shirt, you can do so on our store. Also, we have 29 ratings on iTunes. I just checked. And we have we uh, 26 five-stars ratings. If you guys love our podcast, um, please go Give that support over there. It would mean a ton to us. We love everyone who has given us love, either five stars or the three one stars. Um, you know, haters are our motivators, Dave. Absolutely. Uh, and finally, <laughs> don't forget to check out patreon.com slash podcast. When Ricky and I did it, we also had Jake join us for yeah, uh, the, yeah. the LeBron segment where I had to paint my face. Um, so if you want to go check that out, go do so as well. You can be on a podcast on that $10 tier. But we have some fun stuff for a little bit cheaper as well if you want to help us out monetarily. But let's get into the Carmelo Anthony talk. Dave Woj dropped a bomb earlier today saying that the Thunder, uh, I think it was also Royce Young as well of ESPN, Correct. came out and said that the Thunder plan on either trading Carmelo Anthony if Mm -hmm. an option's available, buying him out outright, or stretching and waiving him. So this isn't majorly shocking. We look at the salary cap situation that the Thunder are currently facing. There are about $310 million on their salary cap alleviating Melo's deal would get rid of about two points, uh, two, 27.9 on his deal, but also I think about $107 million in total. So yeah. a clear option for a guy that should probably be coming off the bench at this point of, in his career, but has an ego of a star. So right now, obviously not too shocking news, but what do you think is the most likely scenario that's going to happen? Do you think a team that is going to want to take on Melo – or do you think they're most likely going to buy him out or stretch him later? I feel like the buyout is the easiest option just because I can't see Sam Presti giving away draft picks to move Carmelo Anthony. He just doesn't seem like the guy who would do it. Uh, and I don't know any team that would be happy to take on Carmelo Anthony, even if they're just going to take him to buy him out. Like, no one without a draft pick is going to do that. You have to attach some sort of value to that terrible contract because no team actually wants him for, you know, $27 million. That's just a ridiculous mm-hmm. number. I think the buyout makes the most sense. It clears it clears off your books after this year. The stretch would be great if you were concerned with money. Right now, the Thunder aren't. Like, let's be fair, they have a super rich owner who gave them a blank check. He's like, do what you got to do. I want a competitive team. So on that front, yes, he's not a $107 million player, but $40 million or $27 million to go away for the season versus stretch over two seasons smart move because next year you can go out and you can pay somebody some more money. Yeah, and well, the other thing too is that he has a no-trade clause still. So yeah. even if you do figure out trades, Melo has to still prove it. So even if you get him a trade going to, let's say, the Bulls or the Sacramento Kings, teams yeah. that have... Wouldn't he love to go play for well, those teams? Teams that have salary cap, yeah. you know, he's most likely not going to want to go play for those teams because they're not going to be in the championship hunt um, unless they those teams they agree to then out. buy yeah. him out. Um, so it's a, it's a tough situation, and again, it's looking like the easiest thing would be to stretch and wave them. Um, and, and going back to at least the Paul George segment that Ricky and I did, people are upset that I kept saying, you know, oh, they'll, they'll have the ability to move when you know, make moves once Carmelo's off. But the thing with Carmelo, and people were like, oh, they have the you know largest salary cap um, in Ever. the NBA. I wasn't denying that they didn't, but the thing is, is that Melo's contract was basically unmovable Correct. unless you found a suitor like this. Or you were going to stretch and wave them. And there was still some negatives to stretching and waving them because you're still going to be paying a ton in luxury cap. Because that, all that money that is going to be waived is going to be paid in the luxury tax. It's not going to be paid to your salary. And right. still, I believe, even if they waive Mello, you're still going to be over the luxury tax and you still have to sign two more players. They or are, you have yep. the ability to sign two more players. So it's still going to be tough for the Thunder to maneuver, but you have easier contracts to move on that OKC team to help out Russ and PG because those two guys are now your pillars 
of that team, and you're going to have to move guys around them with more, much more expensive contracts, and those guys are much more easier to move than Carmelo because, again, that was a $27 million price tag yeah. for a guy that isn't really giving too much to your team. So now with this off the Thunder's chest, they have the ability to breathe um, with Melo away. Once Melo is stretched and waved, what teams do you think will be looking at him and which teams do you think are the best fits for him? I think there's there's something to be said about joining a winner at this point. He could just pull a boogie and like straight up join for MLE with one of the top teams. Mm-hmm. If well, he and went especially to, if he's getting stretched out. I mean, yeah. he's going to still be getting that money. Yeah, he's getting his money one way or the other. So like, why does he care? He could go sign him for, ML, for the MLE for like the Rockets, the Warriors. Um, honestly, I think one of the ones that people are overlooking would be maybe the Trailblazers would be a really interesting fit for him. They get a wing out of it who can score, uh, comes in, and I think that that could almost be like a momentum saver. And I know a lot of people are super negative on Carmelo. I think he'll have a bounce back year. Uh, but if you believe he's the locker room cancer that he could be or doesn't deserve the starting role, then maybe Trailblazers isn't for you. But you look at the top couple teams in the West because that that's what he's familiar with. That's where I feel like he would be at home at. Um, the weird thing is when you start going down further into these lower teams, obviously the Lakers, everybody wants to put everyone on the Lakers right now because of yeah. LeBron James. Do you see him fitting on the Lakers? No, I don't see. I mean, that's the thing is he's going to need to be in the starting lineup. He feels like mellow. an old man Kuzma. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is he, you're going to be taking away time from Kuzma. You're going to be taking time from B.I. Yep. Um, I know that him and LeBron are boys and everything. But again, I don't know if LeBron wants his boys there or at least, you know, Mellow there because it's going to hurt the team. Right. I don't know what te- teams Mellow really helps now, and I don't think the Lakers are one of them just because of the youth on that team. And I know they've been bringing in more veterans. They brought in JaVale, they brought in Rondo, they brought in Lance. Yeah, very um, very great locker room guys. And they need more <laughs> shooting on that team around LeBron. But they then got Steve, adding, that's all they need. Add, adding Mellow in there, it's going to be much more tumultu- it, tumultuous. It'll be complicated. And, and then you're, you, know, you have guys like Lance, like JaVale, like Rondo, who's going to need time. You're going to add Melo onto that. And then the starting five that was just there that are st- you know still decent players and still young guys like Zubak still going to need time. Uh, Mo Wagner, who you just drafted. Obviously, LeBron, Kuzma, B.I., Josh Hart, and Lonzo. Yep. So unless a deal's happening where you're getting rid of some of those young guys for a Kawhi, I don't see Melo fitting on this Laker team at all. Thank you. I think it would be horrible for the Lakers to do that. I know teams, you know, people brought it up, yep. but it would be a bad move. That's so why I want to get Johnson's this out of the part. way right off the bat. Yeah, So, and I think the one team that you did brought up that was interesting was Portland because yeah. they brought in a lot of guards. We, we see the signing of Seth Curry. Um, obviously, Lance and, DJ, uh, Lance and Dame are still there. Uh, not Lance, Lance? CJ. CJ. CJ yeah. and Dame, I'm sorry. Uh, CJ and Dame are still there, and I think they even drafted a, a guard as well. Um, they, they, they did two uh, guards. And, Anthony. Yeah. They drafted Anthony. Um, wait, and I think wait, they wait. even brought in another guard as well. Um, so they're really boasting that 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 front court. So they still need that three help because I think they still have Evan Turner's contract, which is big yikes. But again, <laughs> getting a, a starting three to solidify them would be good. And Blazers Edge, the fan side website, talked about how the Blazers could use their MLE. They threw out names like Vince Carter. They threw out names like Gerald Green, Anthony Morrow, Matt Barnes. But Melo's an upgrade to all of those guys. Absolutely. And he's going to be an instant boost to your team. But in Portland, how much will his ego be affected? Because, again, he'll probably be a starter on that team. Oh, 100%. But how valuable is Melo? Because you saw him last year. He was slow. He hit the most amount of threes, but that's because that's pretty much all he was doing. Um, he showed a little bit of athleticism. He, he's thrown out a couple dunks, but nothing too spectacular. I yeah. feel like Melo needs a clean slate. Maybe Portland would do that, but he's still not going to be getting a ton of touches because Dame and CJ are still electric out there on the floor. So I, I think a team that he probably would be nice on, or at least a team that w- he might be a good fit for him, is a team that moves the ball a lot, a team that really gets a lot of people in, in, going in, in, in the action. And I haven't looked at Utah's, at least, cap space right now or MLE right now. Yeah. Um, but a team like Utah, where they're moving the ball around a lot, would be very interesting because they need some veteran presence. They need someone to hit shots on, shots on the outside. And a team like Phoenix, who you know is kind of bringing in that ball movement style, you know, they're too young to bring in a guy like that. Trevor yeah. Reza is a perfect signing for them. Absolutely. And they already have so many threes. I think something like Utah, not saying Utah exactly, but a team where it's going to be more about the team and rather than players because, again, you have Dame and CJ who need their touches um, unless one of those guys get moved. Where Utah, they don't really have a go-to scorer, even though Donovan Mitchell was fantastic in that. He's in their that go-to right. scorer. Just leave it. Yeah, but but even then, outside of Don Mitch, who is that guy to go to? Melo could be that guy, especially in like a team atmosphere. I mean... You, you freaking moron. It's Joe Ingles. That, that's who's out there. <laughs> that's who's their secondary score. Uh, I, 
it would be an interesting fit putting him in Utah. I don't I don't like it purely because I'm not sure if he fits in with their group of guys and the locker room questions. Yeah. Like that's no offense, but like him and Quinn Snyder together, I don't know if he lasts a year. But maybe he needs a guy like Quinn Snyder. Maybe he needs a guy to get in his <clears throat> face and yell at him. Like like when was the last time Melo had someone that was like really just in his Billy Donovan's yeah, not I was that guy. Say, no. I mean, like he hasn't had anyone tell him no. And now he's being bought out. Maybe it'll be a wake up call to go to Utah. Of all places, pretty much start off, you know, in that area. Start off yeah. where you started your career in that, you know, western, you know, uh, western state. The problem areas. is, is his girl going to want to live in Utah? Like, remember, are they still he together? literally he literally went to New York and stayed in New York yeah. because of her. But are they still together? Uh, I don't know. I thought they were getting divorced. It doesn't matter. Don't they have a kid? Like. Yeah, but uh, so, it, it, whatever. I mean, I, I don't made think, one life decision for him. I don't think, but if we're talking about just teams that fit him, not where he's going to end oh, okay. up going. Okay, I think Utah would be an interesting Utah could fit, fit him if Fair. they can figure out the whole you know no cap situation. Fair. Uh, for me, I think I think the one outside shot, and I'm looking at the East actually, is uh, I'm thinking the Wizards go full in. Like, why not? You already are adding Dwight Howard to this team. That became official today. Um, I know it had been like, yes, this is a thing, but officially signed today, which is awesome. I think adding him to that team gives them a crazy amount of potential because you already have a great one-two with Beal and Wall, or Wall and Beal, whatever. I, I didn't mean it that way, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, Otto Porter, incredibly efficient wing. And then you've got Ubre for depth. You've got, uh, I think... Uh, Sadoransky plus I forgot who the other signee was at um, point guard. But, uh, well, they they brought in Shingard. Rivers. Oh, Austin Rivers at Shingard. Yeah, yeah. They traded so Rivers I think for that Kershaw. I think that adding Carmelo on that team, like the East is wide open. It's it, it's the Celtics and then up for grabs. So if you add Carmelo Anthony to that team, but talk about the personalities. Oh there my and god! No floor general Everyone. out there because Scott Brooks is horrible. <laughs> So, I mean, you're talking about John Wall, who's one of the biggest personalities, at least with the point guard. Correct. I mean, obviously him and Gortat were getting into beefs. Yep. Now, we don't know how him and Dwight will work, but I Amazingly. highly doubt they're going to work because Amazingly. Dwight can't set screens anymore. He just lazily set screens um, now, and that's really what John Wall needs is more screens to get open. Him and Bradley Beal, John Wall and Bradley Beal, aren't the best of friends. You know, Two alphas. Two alphas trying to fight with each other. And then you're getting a third alpha in Carmelo. Like, that is an all-star team, but, like, all of them need to be right? the number one guys. That's why it's perfect. Perfect. You've got four number I, ones. I, I think it's horrible. No, 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 no. I think not. you're you're putting dynamite just with dynamite right there. And, and you you're got just Austin gonna Rivers who a, thinks he's a number one. You're just going to cause a bigger explosion. <laughs> no, I think it's like Three Stooges syndrome, man. They all go for the number <laughs> one, and they all just match them perfectly. Like, this is a situation where any given night, one of these guys could go off and win you a game. Mm-hmm. That's what you need in the East. You need the ability to win games purely off of talent because... LeBron left. LeBron was that. I'm going to win because I'm better than everyone. But so the East is up for grabs now with just Kyrie Hayward and a, a, a roster of Wangs but, in, in Boston. But with that, I mean, let's look at the now the top teams in the East. Yeah. The top three teams are very team oriented. Trust the yes. process in Philly. We look at Boston, one of the best teams in the NBA, right behind Golden State. At least when we're talking about a team mentality. Probably, and we yeah. look at Toronto. Toronto, yep. you can't sleep on Toronto. They got rid of Dwayne Casey, but you talk about team Nick depth, Nurse. Yeah. And Nick Nurse might be even better for this team because he pretty much brought that revolution that we saw in early Toronto True. of shooting more threes, yeah, spacing he, out the he floor. he reworked their entire offense in a season. And, and he did a great job. So maybe even then we're going to see more of a team in Toronto. So we look at those top three teams. I think putting that into the Wizards mentality, and we'll talk about the Pacers too, I think are doing yeah, a great they're, job. Yeah, they're and coming. Um, I think putting that with the Wizards, it might be too much Ooh, going in there. Not, you're, 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 I'm, you're, I'm putting the fire on. I, I just want to put it all in there. I, I think it would be very dangerous there. But at but uh, the same time, could you not see the potential for them to walk away as a one seed going into the playoffs? That roster? Uh, Bo- uh, no, Boston. Even If they sign Melo, I would favor Boston even more. <laughs> That's the thing. Is I, I I get the talent is there. Yeah. But even then, I don't know how much talent Melo even has anymore. I, because he's slow. He doesn't care that much. And he still has that mentality of him being a star. He needs a wake-up call. And I think going to right. Washington, D.C., where he's going to be around more alphas, is just going to exuberate that ment- alpha mentality. So, so or if he goes to a place like, again, just using Utah yeah, again, yeah. who does have their mid-level exception, according to, uh, what's this website? SpotRack. Yep. Um, according to SpotRack, they still have... 8.6 left in their um, non-taxpayer MLE. 
Um, so they still have, uh, I think, the ability to use that on Melo if he's willing to accept that. I think going out to a place like Utah, where, again, it's very team-oriented, they have a very strong head coach who is strong-willed, having a young star in Donovan Mitchell, who he will be able to at least coach and, and teach. Then you also have at least Rudy Gobert, yeah. who's a very strong uh, guy in the middle, obviously Defensive Player of the Year, or, yeah. or at least a candidate. Same with uh, Derek Favors, a guy who kind of changed his whole career as well, because in uh, New Jersey really wasn't that big of a guy. Like, he was a high pick, had kind of an attitude, then was with going out to Utah, kind of revamped his career. We look at Ricky Rubio as well. I think that might be a very nice yeah. fit for him. Um, because if he goes to Miami and goes plays with his buddy D. Wade, then it's just feeding the ego. If he goes and plays uh-huh. with James Harden and Chris Paul, he's just feeding the ego. If he goes yeah. and plays with Braun, he's just feeding that ego again. So I think he needs to go to a place that's going to humble him a little bit, but still be, be in playoff contention. So Golden State. So Golden State, he's going to be the sixth man. It's going to be Iggy. Yeah. It's going to be – well, that's the thing. Is he even going to come off the bench for Golden State? He would. But would he want to? I think that's he would. That's the thing. Is, I don't you know said if, humble. I don't think he starts over any of those guys. No, he doesn't. He's, he, <laughs> he, I, I would take Andre Iguodala over Car- <laughs> Carmelo Anthony right now. Blasphemy. Um, but that's the thing. Is no, like, you're not wrong. He's, he's not starting on that, that Warriors team. I know. So I don't think he even thinks about signing with Golden State. And I don't think he do you think, have the cap Do you think he values well. being a starter more than – Anything else? Is that is that his yes. number one thing? Is it, just I'm Mello, going to be Mello a starter still somewhere. He's Mello. Mello still thinks he is a star. So do you think that playoffs are even necessary? Like, do you think he go to a non-playoff team then? No, I still think he wants to go. Okay, to so a so starter because he's, plus he's, playoff. Yeah, he's still in that 34 age range where he still wants a ring. He still thinks he's a star and can help a playoff team win. He still thinks that he could be a part of a big three. Okay, I think that is still Mello's mentality. If anyone is, if any mellow stands are out there that really want to, you know, back this up, <laughs> they're still out there. You know, maybe, um, but I don't think he can be a part of a big three anymore. That's why I think Utah. It's not really a big three out there. It's the Utah Jazz. Where we look at Indiana, you know, obviously they have a star in Oladipo. Utah has a, a star in uh, Donovan Mitchell. But it's about the team. It's about Indiana, like Toronto. It's not yeah. about Demar Derozan, and Kyle Lowry. It's about the Raptors. He needs to go to one of these types of teams that are okay. in the playoffs, but it's it's more about the team. Like with the Wizards, it's about John Wall and Bradley Beal. That's why I think that would be very dangerous. With the Heat, maybe that would work because the Heat are, that is a uh, team. are, are a team up there. Yeah. But being with D-Wade, we saw D-Wade and LeBron last year in Cleveland not really work out. I mean, he was moved because it just wasn't fitting. He was missing home, and he didn't feel comfortable well, in their offense. He wasn't getting along with the young guys. So then again, yeah, I think if Melo there. goes in there, and he's buddying up with his boy D. Wade, that might cause a rift in the locker room again, which I don't think Pat Riley wants. Yeah. So I, that's why I'm worried about all these teams that are interested, like the Rockets. I think that would throw in a, a wrench in, into their system as well, because their whole idea of offense is running and being fast. And Melo is none of those things. He's not conditioned. I got I got the perfect team for you then. The Timberwolves. No. Drop them at the four, the Hell Timberwolves. No. That's what that team needs. No. <laughs> Hell no. So you're talking about Jimmy Butler being upset about a lackadaisical yes. Carl Anthony Towns. So now you're getting a lackadaisical old man. So now you're getting dealing with Cat and Mello, who are just like, what, I mean, 10 years apart, yeah. like age-wise, that are both lackadaisical and don't care about defense. That's exactly what you do not need in Minnesota. I don't care if you're trying to get a rile. It's stupid to throw out there, Dave. It's a bad oh. idea. Hell no. That'd be garbage. That's my boy, see, Ricky. To see Minnesota pick up Carmelo Anthony Towns. Uh, I said Car- Car- Carl. Carl Mello, An- Carl Mello Anthony Towns. <laughs> Uh, what a horrible human being that would be. What do you think about the Rockets fit, though? Because I, I think it's dangerous. Because having CP3, having Harden, I think he would want to be a part of that big three. I think that, I think that would be dangerous. I think dangerous. that's the obvious one, staring enough. everybody in the face. Because they lost Trevor Reza. He can fill in the minutes. Obviously, he doesn't come anywhere close as far as what Trevor Reza did on defense. Because mm-hmm. Reza was amazing. Yeah, I know he couldn't knock down a shot when they needed him to late in the series. But he was dog-tired by that time. Like, there was... He was literally just playing 48 minutes of defense on KD and every switch anybody on him. Like, I give him so much credit for that. I think that Melo, that's the easiest one. That's one staring everybody in the face. We all talked about it last year. We're like, oh, look at how they're all going to group up. Team Banana Boat's going to reunite. We're going to we're going to Houston. Uh, I think it's the one that makes the most sense. The problem is, like, the way that that would work out best for everybody is if you could work out a trade for Ryan Anderson. Yeah. You move Anderson's contract. You move Melo's contract. Um, there's even one out there tossing out freaking Kevin Love 
just because the Cavs felt lonely. Like <laughs> you, the those two contracts though, um, Ryan Anderson and Carmelo Anthony. I think Anderson's at twenty mil right now. Yeah, twenty point four mil this yeah. year, and then he's got twenty one point two next year. Yeah. So I mean, that's not really helping out. No, but you could find Thunders. a third team. Like you could, yeah. you could do a three team trade to move Anderson because no one wants that contract. And we watched what happened when the Rockets tried to put him on the floor. Like, he was negative 10 in, like, two minutes. Mm -hmm. Like, he just can't play playoff basketball. Regular season, fine. He can drop threes. He can space. We're fine. Can Melo play playoff basketball? Because he wasn't good last year in uh, the playoffs. The the general media, I feel, like, over... Why are you calling me, guys? I'm... On the same podcast as you. Yeah, but like you, you were talking shit about him, and that's that's. I feel like I feel like I should for be standing reason. up for Melo. Like I feel like Melo still has basketball to play. Was he motivated to play in OKC? Not really. Did anyone that did anyone seem to fit in in OKC? Not really. Were they running a shitty offense with one of the most selfish players in the league? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let so me, let me tell you this. Let me tell yeah. you this. All right. So the la- the first four games, he played over thirty minutes. And then the last two games, he played 25 and 25. They couldn't play him. He was not good at all. And then in the... Uh, 25 in, is, is a lot of minutes compared to... Compared to what he would, was right. as a starter. No, I 37, 37, 31, 36. I understand. They cut his minutes significantly. Yes, they did. Um, and then you also look at four of the six games, he was negative. Negative 20, negative 18, negative 6, negative 19. And then in the two games they won, outside of the game that he played, uh, the, the, the game six where he only played 25 minutes... Um, you look at the two games that they won. He shot six times in the g- winning game five, the one, the one they won by eight points. And then game one, he shot 13 times, and they won by eight. The other times, he shot 18, 10, 18. So when he was taking a large amount of shots, they were losing. Yeah, no, I, I so think that Mello he is was about not a, helping that team. I think between like seven and 12 shots a game is where you want Melo at. You don't want to give him a free reign to just chuck up the ball. But because you'd have two great point guards on that uh, uh, Rockets team, mm-hmm. you have the ball control, you have the ball movement, you have everything, you have a great coach, you have a very motivated team who's out there playing with a great mix of veterans and some young kids who are outperforming their expectations. Like I feel like that is the best place that he can succeed yeah. and that they can best utilize his talent because ISO Joe experiment last year, not worth it. The, like I get it, it was a dirt cheap, dirt cheap contract, not worth it though. Like He didn't fit. Melo walks in and fits in like there's like there's no problem. Their defense gets worse. Well, we said that but... last year when he joined the Thunder, and we didn't see how bad he was going to be. I just don't think that Melo going to the Rockets is going to help the Rockets' problem, and I don't think it's going to help Melo's problem. Because, I, again, looking at Melo, he's going to need to be quick. He's going to need to be going up the floor. He's going to need <laughs> yeah. to find himself open. And he wasn't really able to do that But he'll be there year. with his buddy now. That's the difference is him playing with CP3 – game ball movement the other difference is he's not a spot-up shooter and that's what okc turned him into yeah him and paul george both of them got turned to spot shooters and we saw both of them do worse because of it. mellow and is still fairly efficient shooting the ball he no he took about six six threes last year about 35 percent right was he wasn't from bad the year before but when you watch mellow dominate and i know he's far removed from the days of dominating yeah when you watch him dominate it was ball in hand creating for himself he is one of those dinosaurs of the NBA who was all about the ISO game. Like Melo on one side of the court, four dudes dead on the other. I got this. I'm gonna back him down. I'm gonna work my game, and I'm going to score on him. Like that's how he. That's how he won all the games he did. Yeah, I know playoff success never happened, but point aside, him being a spot up shooter was him being used improperly. Yeah. I know it was their offensive scheme to do that, but I don't give a fuck. It was wrong, and you clearly got the results you paid for. So him over on uh, the Rockets where there's a lot of movement off ball, a lot of movement with ball, guys other than James Harden and Chris Paul even taking multiple dribbles with it. Like, I think that is how you are set to succeed with someone who is offensively mine is Mike D'Antoni, who can use him correctly. I think that that is just, like, do this. Please do this. It's the right move, but don't pay for him if you don't have to. Ryan Anderson, move if you can. If not, MLE, come on over. I'm still looking at this Utah Jazz, <coughs> jazz fit, and I think it's something that could be decent. Because- You're uh, because just looking at the way that their offense ran, it yep. was, at least when Don, Don Mitch was holding the ball, it was strictly him, well, not strictly, but majority was him and Rudy Gobert running high high pick, pick sets. Yeah. Um, I think that could be still working with Melo. If Melo's still running screens off ball, then coming to the left side, Rubio passes it to Melo, then he gets a high screen from Rudy Gobert. He's going to be working in that in that offense that he likes. He's going to be able to create for himself. Right. And Melo can still do that. Melo can still cross over, drive in, and pull up from, from two feet in. He doesn't have to be strictly that three-point shooter, but he can be that three-point shooter. So if they want to put him in that jingles, at least fit, 
and, and put him in the corner, he can still be fairly effective. And they don't need to make him exactly that role. And they still do have the cap space. And I think, again, taking him out of that, you know, you're going to be a star, you're going to be a part of yeah. the big three. Because if he joins and Capella's not there, he's the big three. It's, uh, you know, James Harden, CP3, and it's Mello. Those are going to be seen as the guys on that Houston team. And I don't think that helps them beat Golden State. And I think that's Houston's idea is to beat Golden State. I don't think that happens. I don't think adding Mello helps that team. Where, again, Utah, you see, obviously, Gobert is a great great player. You see Donovan Mitchell is a great player. Jingles was fantastic. Ru- uh, Rubio was fantastic. Yeah, they all had a great um, year. Favors you know, was, was fine. He was still a little bit injured. <laughs> Um, so, so it wasn't. And they just added the goat super. and Grayson Allen. Yeah, they, they added Grayson Allen. Uh, Jay Crowder had a, had a revitalize, revitalization. I mean, he was, he was better um, with the Jazz than he was with the the Cavs. Um, Exum was fine when he was healthy. Yeah, Birch actually, was, Birch he was looks fine like he too. Could, yeah. um, so I, I think adding a guy that can be a shooter on the outside, like Melo, and then a guy that can also work kind of in that Donovan Mitchell role, but just in a bigger sense because he's bigger. Um, you know, six eight compared to what six three or six four, whatever Don Mitch is. Right. I think it could be pretty effective and, and work for Mello because again, you're out of that spotlight. You know, you're out of the Houston Golden State, you know, OKC spotlight. True. And you're in just a team idea, and I think having a a guy like Quinn Snyder who will bark at you and make sure you fit into this this team might help Mello rather than D'Antoni, where it's all right, we're gonna play whatever we want, we're gonna take twenty seven threes, even though it's not working. But do you think that Mello is a plus three win, plus five win kind of guy to that team? Do you think he adds that sort of value? Because that's yeah, I think I think he could be. I mean, it's a, if he's used the right way and he buys in. The biggest thing is about him buying in. If Mello buys in, then I think he can be a fine player. But I, that's a, a big if from what we've seen so far from right. Mello. You have to find um, the right motivators. And that's why when we go to D'Antoni, D'Antoni's trying to fit everything into a system, and his system needs to work. That's how they're going to win. And that seems like very Mello mentality where I am Mello. I'm going to do the same things that I've been doing since I was coming into the league in 2003 because I'm Mello. I'm a star. I'm going to do. They're going to stick to their guns, and I don't think D'Antoni's going to help him do that. Mm-hmm. Quinn Snyder is going to throw him into the fire. He's going to make him uncomfortable, and he's going to make him play Utah Jazz basketball. Um, I don't know why I'm so fucking in on this I was Utah say, Jazz thing, really but, like... but I just, I'm trying to think of a team like Utah, and, and Utah is really the only one that I, I'm really getting excited for because I think adding another dangerous score like that could really help this team. Yeah, so, no, they, they needed more scoring. There's no, no denying that at this point in time. Like, if they had more scoring incredibly dangerous team but i mean you look at that the west is so close in the playoffs where like it was 47 wins to get in last year i think this year it's gonna go up i think this year we're gonna see like 49 is the cap Mm -hmm. so when i talk about adding wins to a team i'm like you guys were already incredibly close to not making it to the playoffs last year well they need that big run too that's the thing so i mean you look at that and you go okay we're gonna add mellow who has potential to tank a team yeah so are you okay with that risk reward because you're in year two of donovan mitchell but one one thing with Utah, they also didn't have Gobert for a, a decent I know, chunk. Yeah. So and, and that was Donovan Mitchell's first year. So you assume he's going to get better. Yep. So I, I think. But do you want to invite that potential cancer around Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert? You know. I think I think the thing with that is is just looking at this Jazz team. I think that this team is for sure locked into a playoff spot. I, I think they're more secure than the Trailblazers. I think they're more secure than the Pelicans. I think they're more secure than the Spurs with than the, the whole Kawhi thing. Um, I think they're no. I don't think they're more secure than Thunder. Okay, that, you, that, you that you was what have, I was going to ask you. You still have PG thirty. That's the team that beat you. Yeah, well, that's the, the thun- team. Yeah, you beat. Yeah, as you a beat. Thunder talking. Yeah. Um, but with the Thunder, I think they're more secure just because. Well, well, the Thunder. The Thunder was a team that hit their stride late in the season, and I think they're going to get better with Melo off their team. Psh, they hit their stride. Uh, I don't know if they ever hit their stride. Well, they were, they, but they were. <laughs> they were. They were never consistent. Yeah, they, they were started off good, and, off, and then they, they were really cold. good against yeah. the Warriors and Rockets. Yep. They played down to lesser opponents. I think that might change this year, and I think I think they'll be more. They might finish with forty eight wins still, but I think that's a team that will just at least you know be in there. I think the Rockets, Warriors, and Thunder will still be in there. Um, the Timberwolves, though, we look at the whole Jimmy Butler cat situation. Who it's knows? a mess right yeah. now. Um, so really, I think the Jazz are fairly locked into a right. playoff spot. Um, but let's wrap this up. Sure. What do you think are the top three landing spots for Carmelo, either fit wise or the most likely ones? I think I think Rockets, Lakers, and so we shit on the Lakers, but you throw them <laughs> in it too. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think Rockets, Lakers, and Trailblazers. I think I think he stay west. I think he knows the competition out there. He 
there's something weird about Carmelo where I feel like he's always been trying to prove himself against LeBron. Mm -hmm. Ever since they came in the league, there was that dynamic of them, you know, oh, they went 1-3 in the draft, 1-4, whatever. It was 1-3, I think. Um, And they were always just, like, being pitted against each other. It was pretty clear early on that, like, Carmelo was a better scorer, LeBron was a better player, and we watched LeBron succeed in the playoffs, and Carmelo never did. So I feel like Carmelo got to go to New York. Big market, yeah. man. And, and LeBron obviously now getting to go to L.A. Yeah. So I feel like there's always some sort of tension between the two guys. And I think that him going to L.A. would kind of like be like, well, we can do this together. We can reunite and do this together. It'd be pretty cool. Uh, and then my last one, Trailblazers, because I think that that fit would actually salvage. You know, people are trying to jump ship on the Trailblazers team and say, like, sell on Dame, sell on CJ, rebuild mm-hmm. the team already because all your bad contracts. No, you go heavier into it. You pick up Melo on the MLE and you go, we're going to go in the playoffs with three guys who can score 20 points a night. If there's a team in the East that signs them, who do you think it is? Uh, that brings him in and tries to fit him in. Tries to fit him in? Yeah. I think the Wizards is just hilarious. <laughs> like, that's that's not truthful as far as where he should go in the East, but, like, yeah. The Wizards is the funniest thing for me. I think that that team would be just the biggest like sports news mecca at that point, just because of all the drama <laughs> coming out of there. I think the team most likely to sign him would be Houston. Um, it just seems like that was a fit before he was traded to OKC. It's most likely going to be the fit. I'm not that big of a fan of it. Um, second, I would put the Jazz. I think it'd be smart for him. And then third, I'm going to go away from the Lakers. I'm going to go away from the Trailblazers. I'm going to say the Miami, because I think maybe yeah. he'll be att- attracted to D-Wade. It's more likely than L.A. in my And they're mind. like a quiet team that's going to make the playoffs, probably. Well, so. for sure. In the, in the East, I mean, that's yeah. a team that's, again, they don't have a star. I mean, their best player is Goran Dragic. Um, and you know, he's, he's been fine, but he's not a star in any right. No, they have no stars. Um, that's fair. But they're still a very well-coached team. They have scores in, in many different places. Um, you know, I, I think that's a team that's definitely going to be in the playoffs next year, especially if the Cavs fall out with you know LeBron going. Uh, you you look at the Wizards and Bucks, they'll probably take a rise, but there's no team really. You know, I don't think the Pistons are going to take that big of a jump. I don't think the Hornets are going to take that big of a jump. Uh, Knicks, Nets, Bulls, Magic, Hawks, either. So I, I think yeah, you know, the, the, Heats, the bottom is going to be pretty close to the bottom. The again. Heat's lock in the playoffs is for sure. Uh, we went a little bit too over on, on the camera, so we're, you're, you're seeing the logo right Utah now. Jazz. I like the Jazz. They're fun. They got nice unis. That, you know, that's that's true. Actually, I'm a, like. I'm no, a big, those unions are sick. A big fan of the Jazz, but uh, let you know. Let us know uh, what you think about Carmelo going to any team. What team do you think he's going to go? Down in the comments below. But Dave, let's jump into our next segment. We're hoping this is going to be a thing for as long as we possibly can. Hopefully, we don't. You know, we don't have to bump it. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, with with news coming out, we're going to be doing the summer league roundup number one. We're going to be yep. doing this for 2018 summer league, uh, rounding up the action that happened in the Salt Lake one. Uh, ra- uh, wrapping up the one that happened in uh, Sacramento and now currently the one that's going in Las Vegas. We're recording this um, right now on July 6th at 5.26 p.m. Central Time. Got to give that out because we still have games later on There's tonight. There's like seven more games today. Uh, you still have the uh, Wizards, Cavs, Boston Celtics, Sixers, Bucks, Pistons, Mavericks, Suns, Nuggets, Timberwolves, Clippers, Warriors still going on and currently on right now OKC, uh, Charlotte Hornets, and Brooklyn Nets, Orlando. We still have a ton of action that we can talk about. Yeah. And we're talking about right now to start off, Trey Young. Because Trey Young struggled Ooh. in Utah, struggled for the Atlanta Hawks. There was moments, he had his moments, but he was struggling from the field consistently. His last game was not good from, uh, from the field. His first game was not good from the field. Looked tough. Just getting his shots off wasn't working like it was Back in Oklahoma, we look at that last game. He was 1 of 8 from 3, 3 of 16 from the field. He only finished with 10 points in 30 minutes. Um, He's been struggling so far. What did you take away from Trey Young's performance in the Utah Summer League? I took away the fact that that kid's going to shoot it every chance he gets unless he's in a well-coached offense. Like, when given the green light, he only knows how to do one thing, and that's pull up from 3, from deep 3, regardless of time on the clock, who else is on the team, anybody who could be open— None of that matters to him. He is just there to shoot threes and pretend to be Steph Curry. That's all I'm seeing so far. Like, defensively, non-existent. And offensively, he's not, like, even in a stretch there at Oklahoma, we saw what he could do. He had, a, what he averaged, like, nine assists for a while. Like, he, he was actually a very good... Uh, ten assists, I think. Ten assists, yeah. Like, 27 and 10, I'm pretty sure. Jesus. Uh, very good at finding the open man, setting up his teammates. But 
during summer league, he seems very much out to get for himself. And I don't know if it's the early struggles that then put more pressure on him Mm -hmm. to try to score more points, in which case he just missed more shots and took more poor quality shots. Like someone needs to get this kid into an offense. And that is the biggest concern for me. Well, and I'm going to disagree with you a little bit there, but we do look at what he shot 23% from the field. (laughs) Um, he was just atrocious, wasn't able to find his shots consistently. Um, I, I disagree with the ability of, of you know, setting up teammates, though, because that yeah. was still showing. I mean, there were still times in the offense where he was finding guys in the corner. And there was a lot of times where he would find guys in the corners, and then they would miss their shots. He still right. averaged around 4.3 assists per game in those three games. But there was many times where he found the open man. He was still able to make the right choice in the offense and hit his guy. But it did very much seem like a college offense they were running, and Trey yeah. Young was the star. Um, Omari Spellman was still fantastic. I mean, Omari played Spellman pretty well. balled out in those three games. It was really impressive. Um, and, 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 you know, outside of that, you know, John Collins showed some flashes. He still doesn't look super fluid out there. No, um, not quite. He, he looks still kind of, maybe it's just because, again, it's summer league. So yeah, he, it's, he it's your first game shape game, yeah. Um, but he still looks very loose on the dribble, but he's very physical. I mean, he, that guy is a monster yeah. when attacking the rim. So I, I like some things from the Hawks, but I keep going back to Trey Young, and I'm just worried about you know, what he's going to end up being in the NBA because we looked a lot in the summer league where, you know, going back to college, he would be, you know, well beyond the th- NBA three mm-hmm. um, in college. But now, you know, when he's at the NBA three, how much further can you go back where going. you're going to be efficient? He just keeps moving back. Be- and I think a large part of that is because he's not able to create enough space between him and his defender. And he doesn't, he's not really quick enough to get by his defender around screens. And then he's, you know, trying to force up long, deep threes that are contested. It's just not smart basketball, and I keep going and, and, and worrying about his size and how quick he'll be. Because you look at Luca and, and going back to EuroLeague, one thing that he was fantastic in doing was on one-on-one, uh, you know, when he was one-on-one with a defender, he was able to cross over, create space, step back, and fire a shot. Yeah. Now, Trey Young has a very quick release, but it doesn't feel like he can create that separation enough, and I think it's just because of his size. Luca has that 6'8", you know, what, near 7-foot seven wing, uh, seven wingspan, um, for himself to create, to really create some space with his dribbles, where Trey Young isn't able to do that, and then he's well beyond the three point line. He's yeah. got a defender right in his face, and he's chucking up quick threes where it doesn't really feel like he's going with his motion. I'm worried that that's just going to continue in the NBA, and a large part of his game is confidence. When he's confident, he's when he's confident, <laughs> he's going to be able to hit those shots from the outside. Yeah, a, a large part of shooting is just confidence in general, and you saw it when early on in that Oklahoma season. He was confident. He was firing off shots. Late in that Oklahoma season, he was tired. He was gassed. He wasn't trusting his teammates. And he wasn't as confident as he should have been. Uh, I keep saying confident. confident. He wasn't as confident as he should have been. Yeah. And, and it really showed on the stat sheet. Um, and it, it seems like right away in Atlanta, I'm not saying he's a bust at, at, by any means. But no. These, no. We're seeing why we should be worried about Trey Young. Obviously, he's going to have his bright moments as well. He's going to have his bright moments in the regular season. But I'm just worried that he's never going to be able to find consistent confidence and be able to hit his shots consistently and be a guy that was worth and, and warranted the third overall pick. Is there any concern for you, the fact that his game, he, he hasn't seemed to have changed a thing coming out of college, going into this. Like, it looks like he literally just ended the season yesterday, and today's just the next game. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I feel like he should have at least done something but, as far as like, hey, you know, my second half of the season ended mm-hmm. really poorly, and that was because X, Y, Z. Maybe I should work on that and make sure coming into Summer League, I can show that I can do these things. I, I'm going to agree for a little bit, but also disagree just because you look at Jaron Jackson and, and what he did in Summer League. He took Ooh. more threes, but it was really you know the same player that we saw in college. Marvin Bagley, same player we saw in college. Um, you know Maybe he showed a little bit more aggression on the defensive end, which I did like. Um, we'll get to Bagley in a little bit, but... I'm not too worried about Trey Young, you know, not really changing his game. I know up there too wasn't much a because, long period of time between the two. Yeah, but also, what 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 really could he have changed? Because I think the only thing that I was really worried about is his release, where it's really right in his front of his face instead of it should be up a here bear. when yeah. he's shooting. But then again, I mean, he was so efficient shooting from here, you don't game really want to fix, fix it. it. Yeah, but at some point he might need to fix it. I I, I think the my well the biggest concerns for him is that he needed to get taller. You can't do that. Like you can't bust, physically do that. Bust in some um, extra slide ins for the shoes, you know. And I think he probably needed to get a little bit stronger. But again, that was only what three months yeah. since since he stopped. You playing. You found some muscle, but no, I get since like, March. For for me, it was more about the like the ball control and the smart offensive moves because 
bringing the ball up and with 17 seconds shooting mm-hmm. from the logo is not usually some off, something that offenses well, would ask for. And now this is where this is where I think it comes into coaching and you bring this up. Lloyd Pierce, it's his first time being an NBA coach, and he hasn't been able to set up an offense and, and a system in Atlanta. Right. These are the first games he's coaching, So, at least in Atlanta. Uh, so that's where I am a li- little bit worried, just because he's not going to have that set offense right away. Mm-hmm. And even though Lloyd Pierce is you know, implementing a system and trying to implement a system, he's still going to need to tweak that throughout the season. So it's going to be some growing pains for Trey Young. And maybe Atlanta was thinking, well, if we bring in Lloyd, a guy who's defensive, he can help everyone else, and Trey Young could light up offensively. Well, when that's not happening, Atlanta's really going to struggle. They looked awful, like mm-hmm. flat-out garbage, like hot garbage in some of those games. And that's, to me, one of the scariest things is, when your guy who can only shoot can't hit a bucket, what is he doing out there? Because he was still looking for, and like you said, it's confidence. He was trying to do it. He's trying to force himself out of a bad streak. But like he, for me, you said he was looking for open guys. He's still trying to keep the ball moving. For me, I'm looking at the time left on the clock when he makes those shots, and it was consistently above 15 seconds. Consistently at the point where you could still rotate the ball around, get some more movement out there. Look, Lloyd Pierce's job is basically he's being asked to recreate Golden State's offense. Like, let's be honest. There's no qualms about this. This is what Atlanta's plan was. Yep. We're going to try to recreate Golden State with our young talent here through the draft and see if they can do something similar. Obviously, it's a long shot, but it's you know something to aspire to. Yeah. So looking in that, you know, in that uh, light, like I look at that and I go, yeah, They've got a kid who can shoot from three from really far away. That That's about what you got so far. Well, I, I, Spellman. I, I, I love Spellman. Yeah, Spellman so looks like he's going to be like a um, utility tool. Like he can do a lot of things for you. And he, he struggled in that, that first <clears throat> Memphis game. Uh, but looking back at that game against San Antonio, or it was San Antonio or was it Atlanta? Um, it they was are one, Atlanta. One of them. Uh, no, sorry. Was it Utah <laughs> or was it uh, San Antonio? There was one of them, and maybe it was the first Utah game was they last played. night. Um, there was just a couple times where he was making athletic plays left and right, and it, and it looked very promising. And yeah. he looked so quick for a guy of his size. Um, but one going back to Trey Young, it's the final thing I want to say is you talked a little bit about ball control. Um, I think the biggest thing that he needed to do was just again smart play decision, and I think that might come when an offense is fully set up. Absolutely agree. Um, so Summer league clearly, stuff for those who don't watch it, it's a very dumbed down offense. It's very simple systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, some teams are running some zone defense for the majority of the games. Like yeah. it is not like the highest level of basketball. Well, and again, that's why we can't say right. What is Trey Young going to be a bust? No, that's why we're not no. labeling God, that no. this, this this title of the segment. It's just saying, you know, what we've seen so far is what we. What, what's the worst for this is the worst for Trey Young? Yes, the, the, the worst hopefully scenario, this is the lowest he is. The worst scenario for Trey Young coming into the NBA is exactly what you saw in those first three summer league games. Again, it's summer league, but if teams see this and see that you just need to be physical against him, you need to push him out, back out as far as he can go, and then you just need to crowd him when he's passing the balls, he's going to turn over the ball. He almost had a one to one assist to turnover ratio, yeah. and he's going to miss shots. And he wasn't like missing, like he was missing a couple short, but he was also missing left and right. He and airballed some shit too. <laughs> and, and that's something where you're missing left and right. You are, that something's wrong with your shot. Yeah. So it feels like, again, the confidence wasn't there and he, he just well, wasn't really in in rhythm and he wasn't in an offense. Two notes off so, that. I mean, my, my things off of that exactly is, man, does he seem like the, Nor- the Orlando Magic pick. Like they got lucky that he got sniped from out under them. I'm just saying, it, he that's the most Orlando, Orlando Magic start to a s- segment. Like I feel... That is exactly what he did. But I, as far as applying pressure to him, yeah. Grayson Allen, talk about a guy who got under his skin. Like, holy crap. That was hilarious to watch them get into it because uh, there's a clip out there. It was basically Trey Young's pulling up for a shot. Grayson loops his arm, gets in there so he can't get the shot off. Mm-hmm. And then it gets into a little bit of pushing. And Trey Young pushes his head down. Yeah. And then Grayson tries to walk through him, head down, hands up. You know, and Grayson was fine in summer league. He, the, the game against Atlanta, he was not good. Uh, two of thirteen <clears throat> from the field, uh, zero of two from three. Um, but one thing but that he, he has done, le- yeah, is, is he's done everything else. Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he's been grabbing boards, he's been dishing out assists, and, and that's something where again, in that Utah system, is perfect. And he's because, playing physical defense too. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, th- that Grayson pick so far has looked really it, nice. Fit wise, I think it'll be good for him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Grayson, what we need to see from him is the ability to do whatever the team asks him to do. Because, again, I don't think he's going to be a 15-point scorer in no. the NBA ever. But can he be a guy that comes off the bench and, you know, is could, could be the primary ball handler at points? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, he showed that a little bit at Duke. Can he be a guy that plays off-ball and That's spots exactly up? what I think he will be. Of course. 
Um, but I think he can also be a guy that can be a second second uh, unit leader, yep. um, which I think is going to be great for that Utah team because obviously you're going to have Don Mitch out there. You're going to have Ricky Rubio out there. Having a guy that can lead that second half if you know Exum is hurt, which we've seen before, yeah. if Burks isn't around, Grayson can play off those two guys, which I think is going to be huge for them. Um, and when they want to use Don Mitch in a facilitator yeah, role, when they're playing him at the one, you could put Grayson at the two, which yeah. it, which I think Grayson might not have Go a, a little bigger massive minute uh, allocation this year, but he will at least yeah get he might be some, a fifteen minute game times. guy, but still I think he like early on the impact seems solid across the board. I think the shooting will come with time. Um, other guys that at least in that Utah. Um, Summer League, Triple J was fantastic. That first game was just a joke, right? Unreal. Like, he just walks out there. He's like, some of you behind this three-point line, if you need me, I'm just I'm just here dropping shots that look like a shot put. But they go in, baby. Well, I mean, it, it's something weird, too, where it, that's not a fluid shot. No. What, and, and it was no. more fluid in college, but that's because he was closer. Now when he's a little bit further back, they're still sinking. Yeah. But it, it still looks like he's it looks like he's pushing the ball out rather than letting it roll out. And I think that's something that's going to fit for him. But defensively, holy crap, was he fantastic. I don't think he had a personal foul in those three games. I um, love someone it. Someone will fact check me on that. But man, was he just a monster defensively. And it was absolutely awesome to watch. And we talk about why, you know, Trey Young in those first three games, what would go wrong for Trey Young. This is exactly what would go right for Jaron Jackson. This is why you should have Jaren, drafted Jaron like Jackson. I feel like redeemed for And this you look because... at Trey Young, this is why you shouldn't have drafted Trey Young, pretty much. Yep. The the instant gratification of going, yeah, I'm the I'm the guy who was like, nah, he's probably he he like Ricky's all about Bomb is the best big walking away from this draft. I'm like, Jaron Jackson had every tool that like he looked like that guy who small role at a fantastic school, and now we summer league is like, oh yeah, let's let's see what he can do when you open it up. Yeah. And game one, we watch him take a bunch of threes, make a bunch of threes, and sink them. Uh, game two, they wanted to work on his inside game. He passed up on threes that he could have shot, potentially made, to try to work on taking the ball to the hoop and playing off the roll. Like, I'm really interested because it seems like they're actively trying to like push him to do different things during summer league and not just letting him have free reign on what he wants to do. So I love it. I love how he looks out there. He can guard fucking like one through five right now in my mind. Like he's just insane. He's um, insane. Any other guys you want to mention from Utah? Derek White Jr. was one of them from San Antonio. Stand out, yeah. Um, really good in the first game. He had 21 points. Um, I don't know what his role would be on San Antonio, though. I mean, I, I don't know if he's going to be an NBA guy. Because yeah. he's been a guy that's been in the league for a while. I, I think he's going to be probably like a... Pro, he's, he's bench unit for sure, but now with Tony Parker leaving, things being rotated around on that team, I think he finds himself a chunk of minutes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um Disappointing not to see uh, good old Lonnie Walker, but we'll we'll see him at some point. Yeah. Um, we look at now the Sacramento Summer League, and there's a couple of guys that we want to talk about. Um, one of them, first off, is going to be Svi. Svi Mikhailuk from the Lakers. Um, I know he wasn't you know lighting it up with 20-plus points, but oh my God, is he going to be great in the NBA. Second rounder, you saw him shooting off ball. You saw him driving and attacking the rim. He's a guy that, again, he's not going to be an NBA starter, but he is going to be a guy that sticks around the league, in my mind, for the next and probably 10 years. He might yeah. be in that Kyle Korver, J.J. Redick area where he's going to be a dangerous shooter from the outside. Maybe a little bit more, maybe... He'll be more like Doug McDermott. Thank you. But maybe Thank a little more your... quality. Yeah. I think I think he is going to be a guy that can stick and around Dougie the league. And Doug, did just get paid, to be fair. Yeah, three like, years, $22 not... million. We'll talk about him in the next video yeah. because he's on the Pacers. But I absolutely loved what I saw from Mikhail Luke. Absolutely yeah, that fantastic. Was, it was super impressive. I did not expect him to come out that strong. Uh, but well done to him. For me, it, it was completely, completely about this Sacramento team. Like, I just, the, the whole team was interesting because... Darren Fox looked sharp out there. He looked like a man playing against boys. Mm -hmm. um, knows exactly what he was doing with it. Uh, I finally got to see my boy, and I've been waiting for Harry Giles to come out and like all the talk this past season was hyping him up to unrealistic standards. He was basically going to be like you know basically just God walking on the court. He was <laughs> not. He was not uh, the reincarnation of oh God who who is uh, the guy they picked up a uh, long time ago. Can we talk about Sacramento. Yeah, yeah. Who who's the last great power for? Chris Webber? Yeah, he, he was not Chris Webber, too. He's not Chris Webber 2.0 yet. Uh, but what he is is a solid big who bulked up immensely during the offseason. Mm -hmm. He looks solid. He looks uh, really strong. I like his post moves. His shot's okay. He's got a shit ton of turnovers, but that's because they were asking him to actually dribble a lot down low, yeah. which is interesting. And then the biggest one, you got to talk about Bagley. you got to talk about the man who can't go right. 
Yeah, he, that that's the biggest concern I took away from Bagley. Other than that, he was great. Yeah. Um, defensive motor was up. He's not great one on one defensively yet. Um, there was times where Mo Wagner was just taking it to him physically. Um, down down the low post. But there was times where they were playing a zone where, again, he was comfortable in that in Duke. Um, there was times where coming off the weak side, he was coming over and crowding the, crowding the rim and being a pretty decent rim protector. Um, he wasn't super consistent in the summer league, which is a little bit of a concern. But Bagley still looks like a monster. But you're right about at least going right. And that was one concern that, that was on uh, at least the uh, scouting report of Bagley was he loves going to his left, loves attacking with his left. If you force him to go right and defenders are smart, yeah. he's going to really struggle. And if we're talking about a guy with at least his his big plus being offensive, if you're taking away his ability to be offensive, what can he truly be? Jordan so, Bell just dumped a giant hot steamy deuce on his face, basically. That, so like, that was Jordan cash Bell's considerations, so yo. Cash considerations. But with Bagley, it, it's something that's very concerning for him. Again, yes. he's still very young, but... Again, if he's not going to be able to, you know, attack from the outside, he's not a knockdown shooter. No. I mean, I mean, Jaron Jackson hitting six of out of eight threes was unreal. Um, but it's not something that he's probably going to replicate I mean, he, quite often. He was a forty percent. Yeah, you know, he'll be he'll be at thirty five to forty percent yeah, range shooter. But six of eight. He's That's a little higher six than of eight that. too I often. Know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Bagley was a little worse, and and Bagley also doesn't have as smooth of a shot. And yep. Jackson, we're talking about Jackson pushing the ball out rather than actually stroking it. Um, so with Bagley, if he's not able to hit that outside shot. Then defenders can just play him to his right, and then he's just taken away offensively. And maybe he just turns into a rim runner, which then, using looking at that second pick, we look at who was behind him in Luka Doncic. Maybe it was a mistake. Again, way too early. Yeah. It's only been three games in the summer league. But maybe if he's not able to, again, work on his ability to go right, this could be something that's very, you know, very dangerous to his career. And it's something that we'll look back on is, how is he going to fix it? How is he, he going to develop? To, yeah, and how that, is he going to grow? That's the biggest takeaway for me is he needs to learn to use the other hand to finish. If he can't do that, he will forever be a limited player. Like, yes, mm-hmm. he has an awesome motor. Like you said, yes, he just has a ton of energy. And defensively, there, there's the potential to grow there. But if you can't finish with the other hand, players will just scout that. And then you have, like, no offense, Jordan Bell, you're a fantastic player. But you're not exactly all NBA defense. You are very good, but you're not all NBA defense. Yeah. So if that's the kind of people you're going up against night in, night out, yikes Mm -hmm. yikes and and with Bagley again it's how how are they going to work him into the offense because again you have Harry Giles you have scale you have Willie Colley Stein you have Marvin Bagley there's a lot of guys Mm -hmm. in that backcourt that it's just going to be worrisome how those guys are going to get their minutes and then if this Kings team is trying to win which I don't think they're going to be winning um, but if they are you know going into crunch time and again, Bagley is getting shut down. He's just going to be on the bench and he's not going to be able to build and grow. And that's something where he's going to stunt his growth. And if he's not working and taking that time to fix that on his own time, then he might never fix it. And that's going to be something that could be detriment- detrimental yeah. so to detrimental. So we got the number career. two and number three picks. A little concerning so far. And we haven't seen Aiton yet. Um, and I, I think there's even talks that Aiton's uh, back has been hurting him. So we might um, not see him play tonight. So again, concerning there. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think we're going to see him. Um, start for the Suns tonight in the summer league. Uh, the fourth pick, Jaron Jackson, was pretty damn good. Um, yeah, so super far. impressive. Um, and then the fifth pick, Luca. Obviously, he's having contract disputes. He's well, sh- he needs to get out of the Real Madrid contract. That'll yeah. get done well, probably then, in the, within the month. And then also with that, um, you know, he's been playing so much, so we're probably not going to see him until you yeah. know preseason because they're probably going to hold him off. In did you see that amazing highlight of him uh, working out for the Mavs? <laughs> yeah, shooting the, into the uh, light in the ceiling. The yeah, that was nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and also real quick uh, with the Lakers because they were in Sacramento. Josh Hart looks fantastic. Josh Hart, Hart looks Hart looks like a pro. Insane. Like I love it. Uh, um, Derek Jones Jr. from Miami again, mm-hmm. a guy who two way contract looks like he's ready to take the next step. Super athletic kid. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I love like him coming up behind. Um, God, I can never remember names. Winslow. Yeah, him coming up behind Winslow. I think is the perfect thing. Like. He has a guy in front of him who is a defensive monster, mm-hmm. who is very physical, who is now growing as a ball hand, a secondary ball handler, and is growing his shot. Exact same path Derek Jones Jr. needs to take. He's got the template right in front of him. Yeah. Like I think this is just brilliant move by them to, to bring in somebody in the exact same mold. And real quick, I just want to talk a little bit more about the Lakers just because you know you yeah, bring in no, you bring in you you bring in Braun and you need shooters around him. Josh Hart showed that. Mo Wagner showed that a little bit too, and, and obviously Svi as well. Yep. Um, so that's one thing where maybe you don't trade for Kawhi Leonard. All those I've shooters, you're just going with young guys. 
Yeah, but bold and, move. And I love, I love that. Give me. That's why I hated the LeBron signing. Give me the young kids. You want, you want these, just you want to see them grow. I want to see these kids grow. I want to see these kids have a chance to grow. I called that this team was going. This team. You just, and I get out of LeBron. You know, get, get, take Brown out there. This three team years. by himself would have been a, a playoff team in three years. But now, yep. obviously, that's accelerated a little bit. A um, couple guys I also want to mention before we wrap this up. Um, Isaiah Hartenstein was able to watch him. Um, I believe it was in the first game uh, of the summer first league second, in, yeah. in, in Las Vegas. He was fantastic. Uh, last year, he was selected um, in the second round. I don't have his pick up um, by the Rockets. So. Uh, draft and stash didn't play last year, but playing now in the summer league, holy crap! This kid's seven feet tall, like looks fairly comfortable <coughs> dribbling the ball, and maybe you know he, he doesn't have a shot from the outside, but he looks super aggressive. Yeah. He, he was blocking shots in his first game. Here's his stat line: three of five from the field, twelve points, twenty five minutes. Did not take an outside shot. Was six and nine from the uh, from the line, which is pretty decent. Uh, two offensive boards, nine defensive boards, eleven rebounds total, one assist. Four turnovers, a little sloppy. Got to work on that. Uh, but again, he's not super comfortable passing the ball, um, and, and some of them were, you know, just miscommunications. And again, they're not running a true offense. Um, but defensively, three steals, four blocks. Holy crap, he was great. Um, and the other thing too is uh, he was on. He was covering covering uh, both Pacer guards, uh, Sumner from Xavier, and then uh, Aaron Holiday out of UCLA, their first round draft pick. Um, one was on Holiday. Holiday ends up hitting the shot, but Holiday goes to his left. Then crosses back over, and he has so much space between him and Hartenstein. And you're like, oh, God, why is a big man covering Aaron Holiday? But the closeout on the shot was fairly decent. He was in his face. Holiday just sunk the shot, and it was a great move by him. Yeah. Um, so he still has that potential to grow into possibly a pretty decent defender who with switchability. And then the other time he gets switched on Sumner, Sumner drives to his left. Hartenstein's trailing back a little bit, but he's able to at least make up that ground and try to block the shot. Really impressive what I saw from him on both ends. Um, he's a guy that definitely needs time, um, but he might be a guy in that Houston system might work fairly well. And he was a guy that uh, they got, I believe, pick right, forty three. F- pick forty three. Um, yeah, really liked him. Uh, I think I had him in my first round of my mock. Uh, really impressed with him in, in his first showing in the summer league. Any guys uh, else from today? I mean, in that Vegas we, we saw we just saw a tiny bit of the moist one and uh, Malik Monk, uh, who second year player, obviously did not have a long leash his rookie year but showed a lot in the last month, basically, mm-hmm. where he got to play and he was just dropping shots left and right. Uh, early when I looked, he had like 18 points in 12 minutes. Like, he is a microwave of scoring. Like, that's what he does. He does it well. He doesn't play great defense. He will not give you a ton of assists or rebounds, but the dude can shoot lights out all day. And that's what I love about him, and I'm really looking forward to seeing him get more minutes this year. Stat line as of now, 17 minutes, 18 points, 7 of 12 from the field, 4 of 8 from Three, so cooled off a little bit. One assist, one turnover, one steal with plus nine. Miles Bridges also played in that game. Has struggled. 18 minutes, six points, two of 11 from the field, 0 of 4 from three, two of two from the line. Has seven boards, two assists, and two turnovers. Um, also in that game, you got Willie Hernan Gomez, Devontae Graham, Dwayne Bacon. A lot of young guys on that uh, Charlotte Hornets That's what they team, need. Which will be interesting. That's what they need. They, um, they got a lot of bad contract. Yeah, and the other guy that I wanted to mention from that game as well, uh, that Houston Rockets Pacers yeah. game. I believe it was that Pacers game. Let me, let me pull it. No, it was, sorry. It was the Pelicans game. Oh, Pelicans okay. game. Pelicans won. It's 90 to 77. This is a kid that you got to watch out for. Um, I believe it was either in my first mock I ever did or one of the first mocks I ever did. Or and then I think it was the next year. I didn't put him in this mock because um, he ended up going undrafted. Um, but the Pelicans picked him up. Trayvon Blewett. Um, out oh, of Xavier, yeah. this yeah. kid is a. We want to talk about microwave of scoring. That's all this kid does. Really can't play defense, but <laughs> oh my god, this kid was fantastic. 19 minutes, 24 points, seven to ten from the field, six of eight from three, four for four from the line. Also grabbed six boards, two assists, one turnover. Uh, go back and to the 2016 game against Cincinnati, he puts up 40 points. He hits his first like 10 shots. Um, absolutely microwave of scoring, quick release, quick shot. And for the Pelicans, this is a team that, again, was really thin at that three spot last year. If a guy like Blewett, and then he's 6'5", so he might be more of a two, um, maybe can fill in for each one more. But he's a guy, pretty lanky, yeah. can hit a shot from the outside, which might be really great for this Pelicans team when AD isn't there, um, you know, or AD's not scoring. You will be able to at least possibly bring him off the bench. I don't know what his contract situation is, but with the way he's scoring, he should at least make a G League team, maybe even an NBA team. Really interested to see what he will be able to do. Love the kid coming out of Xavier. Um, so he's an interesting kid that you got to watch out for. 19 minutes, 24 points. Absolutely fantastic. Um, any other kids you want to mention, Dave? Uh, literally the entire Orlando Magic, because they're all starters. Uh, 
No, I even in the summer league. Even in summer league, uh, Jonathan Isaac looks to have a good stroke again, uh, which is awesome because last year, obviously with the injuries, he was kind of struggling a little bit. Uh, but right now, early on, twenty six minutes, sixteen points, seven to fifteen from the field, which is the key there. They got a long, long roster between him and Bamba and uh, was the Iwindu. Like, yeah, those three guys are like six seven and up. I think I Iwindu's six seven or six eight. Like, just tall, tall guys. <laughs> Uh, no, I, other than that, I mean, Bamba's shooting okay. He's got like 11 points. He's doing okay. Yeah, and obviously it's the first game of the Summer League. So let us know what guys really impressed you. I know uh, we we're going to talk about week uh, two. Wayne I mean, Selden. You know, yeah, impressed Wayne you. popped off early on too. Uh, and there were some, some other guys that were pretty impressive as well. So let us know who you liked so far, even uh, at least Johnson. I know someone uh, called us out for not having uh, him in our mock. It's true. Our last mock, he has uh, 16 points uh, in, in 15 minutes for the Pacers. So let us know who impressed you so far through the Summer League. we still got more weeks to come. It's going yeah. to be some fun. One time what guy what guy ha- that hasn't played so far uh that you're interested in seeing well what guy are you kind of looking either uh, second year guys that you know, want to see how they progress or uh are rookies honestly i want to see mitchell robinson play that's the one guy who i'm like you're just a mystery i don't know what he is mm-hmm. I-, I know he's a seven footer i know he was supposed to be athletic as all get out and you know going into the year he was like a top five top ten prospect in that class like I want to know what he is and what he can do on the court playing against other professional athletes. Yeah. You're uh, off basketball is a, a, an interesting move. Nuggets are at least, uh, what's it called? Nuggets are playing tonight, uh, but they announced that Michael Porter Jr. will not be playing. So that, Surprise. That's, that's a bummer. Um, would love to see how he oh would do. Oh, my God, yes. Um, but obviously, you know, we're, we're not going to be expecting too much for him. I, I don't think Markel's playing either uh, in the Summer League. No, for, he, for, his for shooting coach Sixers. said he is not playing Summer League at all. Yeah, so that's that's another bummer. Uh, that's the one thing that is, but is a little Zaire downside. But Smith, Jonah Bolden, mm-hmm. like well, there's a lot of guys on that Sixers team. Yeah, and then the other guy I want to mention is uh, Minnesota Timberwolves, Josh Kogi. Um, oh. My, my love, DeAnthony Melton. Really struggled today. Yeah, he, he hasn't played he basketball in a year. He had a rough one. Um, but Josh Akogi, Minnesota Timberwolves, definitely watch out for him. That kid is going to be something special. But again, let us know who you like down in the comments below. Who should we watch out for? Who should we mention in the next Summer League Roundup? But let's move into the final topic, Dave. We're talking about the Indiana Pacers. Pacers have made some interesting moves to bolster this team that lost to the Cavs in the first round. I thought they were going to get swept. They took them to seven. Really impressive. Uh, showing. Hell of a and showing. We didn't expect too much from the Pacers going into the season last year. I don't think any of us had them in the playoffs last year. I wasn't too high on Nate McMillan, but I got to give props where props are due. Fantastic job by Nate McMillan. We look at Victor Oladipo. He was fantastic. Incredible. And we see now the additions that they have made. Uh, Tyreek Evans assigning for 12 mil. We look at Doug McDermott bringing him in for 6.9 mil. Kyle O'Quinn bringing him in for 4.4 mil. So a lot of nice additions to this Pacers team. And I'm going to make the statement now. Yeah. The Pacers are going to be in the Eastern Conference Finals next year. What? In the 2018-2019 season, they will be in the Eastern Conference Finals. You're crazy. I'm not crazy. You are crazy. This is a team that is a team. This is like, it's so weird to say that, but this isn't based off stars. This is based off being one. This is being a unit. And you added three guys that are really quintessential to that. Kyle Quinn does everything for this, for, for a team. He, he grabs boards, score points, uh, dishes out the ball. Very, you know, good big man who can, who can do a lot for a team. Yeah. Doug McDermott could be scoring off the bench, which I really love. And, and pairing him with Boyan, who Boyan showed great defensive abilities. Yeah. Him, those two. Surprisingly at, athletic for a white guy. Those two at the three, absolutely fantastic. Reek, we're talking about, you know, his ability to oh score. God. Comebacks. His, his resurgence has been fantastic. So why not go to the place that has resurged careers in Indiana? And obviously you have a star in Victor Oladipo. I think this team can have a really nice run and make it to the Eastern Conference Finals because we look at Boston. Boston's dealt with so many health injuries, same, or health, you know, health yeah. problems. We looked at uh, Philadelphia, same thing. And Toronto, what will they actually be? They're going to have to get r- r- over one of those teams in the playoffs, but I think they have the ability to do so. Um, maybe not Boston if they meet in the first round or the second round, but if the Pacers get a four or fifth seed or maybe you know even a, a three or two seed, um, we'll be able to take down Philadelphia or Toronto, and I think they will go to the Eastern Conference Finals. You watch yourself. Those are some bold claims off the top, Sean. Book it for Flashback Friday when I'm wrong. I was going to say, what, what's, what's, the the bet this time? what's the bet this time no, for a Finals team? No bets? No, no I'm not making bets. You, you learned your I, lesson? I, paint grape, I painted grape jelly on my face <laughs> from LeBron, so I'm garbage. 
I wish I could have been there for that. I'll be honest. My face is so dry after. I that. know. So it bad. looked hilarious. It was um, bad. But I, I don't think this team will be a bad. I, I think this team, especially with Miles Turner, I didn't even mentioned. I say Miles um, Turner, Demonte Sabonis, like they just have guys on that team, and even Thad Young. Thad Young, he's been the veteran of the team. Yeah. Uh, I I like them. I don't know if I'm putting them in my Eastern Conference Finals, but I like them because I like Victor Oladipo getting help, and that's exactly what he needed. He needs someone like Tyreek Evans who can come in, play on ball, and take over offense so that way Victor Oladipo can rest a little bit because defensively he was a stud. He had 2.4 steals a game last year. That's nuts. He was super aggressive, uh, super, uh, like, he's a great on-ball defender. Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as how he played off-ball, he was okay. But still, like, on ball, he gave it everything. He was just worn out by the end. Put up almost oh, just over 23 points a game last year. Honestly, like, I don't know if I can if he goes to be a 25-point-a-game scorer. I think the addition of Tyreek means he probably won't be. I think that those two are going to share the load heavily. I think Tyreek even regresses a little bit because last year was just incredible, and he was playing on a terrible team yep. where he was basically given the reins. So, like, slightly padded numbers. But still, like, I think he's going to put up, you know, 16-plus points a game. So... Those two guys are your primary scores. You're in good business. And then you've got stretching the floor with Miles Turner, Sabonis, and you added McDermott. You got Boyan, shoot from the outside. Like They have a great makeup. I like what they've done as far as building this team out because mm-hmm. all these guys are under 30. Like They've just got a great young core together. And if they can shake it out and see you know where they land up, I, I don't know if I've got them beating you know the Celtics, the Sixers, the Raptors. Yeah. But I think they're definitely established on that tier alongside Milwaukee. I think they're right there. Like I think Giannis, he elevates that team incredibly. And we'll see what happens to Jabari in free agency and yeah. what happens. Well, and how Bud takes to that team. And how Bud addition, like having a real coach, what could that do for Giannis? That'll be a whole nother discussion. But I think they're on the same tier. I think those two teams, they're both scary as hell for different reasons. What Giannis can do on his own is terrifying. What the Pacers can do as a team, like you said, I think their teamwork will really stand out, and I think what they could do is second round. I'll give you a second round depending on matchup. You know, if they match up poorly, maybe not. But. Well, that's the thing is, I think if they match up against Boston, I think they lose that in the second round. But if they go up against Philadelphia, I think they're a better coach team and a deeper team than Philadelphia. I think they end up winning that one. The biggest concern for that team and, and for that matchup would be how do they match up with Joe inside? You because don't. Miles Turner isn't that great defensively. He's not a strong player. Yeah. Um. He, he's very he's he's very timid. Not a guy that's going to be attacking the boards. Um. For a big man, doesn't really use his size and his ability. Um. And going up against Joe would be very concerning. Yeah. But I mean, we look at the athletes, and and maybe they're able to slow down. Um. You know, Ben a little bit, and I think they can at least uh slow down the game enough where you know Philadelphia isn't able to move in transition. Um. I think the, what we saw from Brett Brown's Philadelphia 76ers could be attacked. You know what we saw in the second round uh, from from the Philadelphia Brett 76ers. Brett Brown can't coach. Could could be attacked by matchups by the Pacers just because they are so deep and can continually yeah. give them uh, tough matchups. Yeah. No. Um, and and you even mentioned it again. All of them are under 30. Thad Young 30. Darren Collison 30. Those are the oldest guys. And that's on the thing. Team. Like Darren Collison's not even like a stud. He's just there. He, well, he's, he's a good. consistent like, he's, veteran. He's good. Like, yeah. He's he's consistent. He's a guy that is is a, you know very um, even keel. A guy that's just going to be there. He's going to do his job. Um, you know, same with Aaron Holiday, uh, and he's a guy that was just brought in as a rookie. Their rookies are, are I mean, you still have a lot of youth on this team as well. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. TJ Leaf, Aaron Holiday, um, Ike Anabogu, um from UCLA. Aaron Holiday. Another guy we didn't even mention him. Uh, you mentioned him shooting a little bit, but like yeah. a guy who first game in summer league looked really good. Mm-hmm. Looks like a uh, scoring guard off the bench. Yeah. Exactly what they need. Well, and he's a, he's a guy that I think could fit in that Collinson role where Collinson, you know, early in his career was putting up I think about 15 points per game um, and dishing out you know around five to six assists per game. I think at Holiday's peak he could do that as well. Yeah. So um, I mean that and and even then they also have Sumner as well, who's a guard um, guy that was floating up and down. Uh, from the summer league and, and from the the, the big G club, league. Uh, the G League. I'm sorry, uh, the G League and the the Indiana uh, Indiana club last year. Um, Sumner is a kid from Xavier who hurt yeah. uh, his ACL in his senior year or junior year, and then went into the NBA. So he's still recovering. And now it's going to really show how good he is. He's more of a driving guard, um, a guy that can really attack with his frame, bigger guard. Um, so. I really love the makeup of this team and adding guys like McDermott, adding guys like O'Quinn, those guys are at least adding playoff experience in McDermott and and O'Quinn at least brings more physicality to this Pacers team. It's funny you bring up playoff experience in McDermott. I'm like, 
I mean, Since he has when? played in the playoffs. He did technically play on, what, the Bulls team in the playoffs? Well, OKC okay, last year. He had, yeah, 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 yeah. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for adding that. But yeah, no, he did play for uh, the Chicago uh, Bulls 2014-2015. Uh, yeah, that uh, one I remembered. Three games. The OKC, I forgot OKC that like, he actually got minutes in those games, but they were they were pretty, yeah. I mean, he, he only averages 9.5 minutes Wait, per he game. Wait, didn't? Didn't? Yeah. Okay. He only averaged 9.5 minutes per game in his career. I was say, didn't he end he the played. season on uh, the Mavs, though? No. He ended on OKC. He started with the Mavs, ended with OKC. Okay. And and But you look at his stats at Dallas, he was unreal. Uh, and then he was traded to, um, uh, what's it called? He was traded to OKC. But you look at what he did in, oh, no, I'm sorry. He was in, fuck, he was in OKC last year. Yeah, I was going to say. The year before. He, um, he went, he went uh, to the Mellow trade. He was part of that. So he went to the Knicks. And then went to the Dallas. The Knicks traded him. Okay. But you look at what he did in Dallas, 49%. Yeah, almost he was, 50%, he was shooting fire. Um, um, from three. He's a guy that I think could add, you know, nice scoring to that bench. And again, he, st- um, he still brings playoff experience. Yeah. Is what I'm trying to say. Fair enough. <laughs> um, he brings playoff experience. O'Quinn at least brings grits, which I do like. Yeah. Um, and, and again, Reek, we got to talk about him. He's a guy that if he keeps at what he was, really, really nice start. He got back him. to his rookie year. Yeah. <laughs> was he a little bit above or was he right on point? Uh, I think well, he's a better shooter because he couldn't shoot when he first came in the league. He was really bad from shooting from the outside <laughs> in his league. He was more of a point guard um, when he first came he, in the league. He was a point guard. That's the problem. Yeah. They played him out of position after that and they really fucked him over. His rookie year was 25-5 uh, and five, and then this year was 25-5. and five. Yeah, he was pretty much the same thing. Slightly worse than his rookie year. I take it back. But better shooter. He was uh, 25% from three in yeah. his rookie year. 39. And 39, yeah. So... No, he has developed that three point shot. Yeah. So I mean he's a he's a guy that I think could be really interesting on that team. And, and looking I love at it. what this what, huge ad. what this team most likely will be, at least starting lineup wise. We also have a mentioned Co- Kojo as well. Corey Joseph. Yeah. Was a little disappointing in that Pacers team. Yeah. Um but we can you know I mean, he's still young. We'll see how he develops um and takes to it. But that, that starting lineup, um probably going to be what, Ola Depot? Probably Ryan Collison out there. I'd I'd hmm. Yeah, I would probably say Collison, Oladipo, Tyreek, uh, Sabonis, and then Turner. And then we're going to have, coming off the bench, Kojo. Um, you're going to have, uh, so, Thad Young, uh, Boyan. Yep. So, Boyan off the bench, you like that? I mean, yes. Because that's the thing is, like, I, the I love The dude can abuse Tyreke, second but units. Oh, but you think he should run the second unit. I think he should run the second he, unit. You think he's Vic 2.0, but then for, like, late game situations, they play side by side? Yeah. Okay. I, th- I, I, I think... I, I think thought we are talking, like, best line of versus, like... Well, okay. that's the thing is, I think I think you're probably, at the end of the game, then you're taking out Collinson, you're going to put Vic Depot, at the one. then Tyreek, uh, Tyre- then probably Boyan yep. for shooting, and then Sabonis for that kind of grit and at least uh, that kind of I mean of, him you or know, Thad Young they're interchangeable at that point yeah but, well, but I like I like Sabonis better Sabonis has a better Could, shot Thad Young is better on the inside depends on what they need yeah but that's why Turner brings that shot from the yep. outside um, no I mean they, I think they've got a really well rounded team mm-hmm. and I, I love what they've done I love the ads and that's the weirdest thing is like this is a team who a year ago were like man they just traded away Paul George for pennies on the dollar mm-hmm. they get they get Victor Oladipo who has you know never Grown in Orlando, he had like a an okay year in OKC, but he just kind of looked like like a weak version, a watered down version of Russ, basically. And then what what do we see? He turned into his own man here, exploded because we all learned Orlando doesn't have development for anyone. Like they just didn't have a player development team, didn't exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, OKC, he literally was just playing in the shadow of Russ. And then my boy Sabonis, the man I loved coming out of college, like that, my hype train for him off the charts. He just he's got talent. Like, given the right situation, the dude's a dude's a stud. Well, and, and with Sabonis, as Joey Coco Diaz would say, he's got immigrant mentality. He's got that. <laughs> he's got that fuck you mentality. He's gonna take it to you. I, I love what Sabonis brings, and he yeah. brings what you need in the playoffs. He brings that physicality. He yes. brings that 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 intensity, especially on the boards. That that is absolutely necessary for a team to succeed. And that's why you know you look at that Toronto team. Toronto isn't that great of a rebounding team. Um, I mean, you have Valanciunas, you have Ibaka, um, and you, I mean, you can even throw Siakam in there as well. Yeah, um, I absolutely Pertle as well. Um, but I look at Sabonis, and I think he's going to grow even more. And I think he's he's still going to be more physical. He's still going to be more, um, you know, he's going to get stronger, clearly. Um, and he's going to be able to at least grab more boards. And, and the biggest thing for this team, I think, um, at least growing, I think Vic needs to become um, at least more of a, a better passer. Um, I mean, he, yeah. he's, he's not a terrible he's a bit passer. He's turnover happy. 
He needs to become a better passer, make smarter decisions, um, which I think, you know, get, stepping into that right um, and stepping into that position will come naturally. Um, we look at, you know, Tyreek. I think Tyreek will do enough. I think maybe if he's able to step up a little more defensively, then that would be a huge plus for them. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest step, at least player development-wise, needs to be for Miles Turner. And he needs to become stronger. He needs to be more assertive. And he needs to be able to at least grab more boards. I mean, he's be kind of becoming into a worse Al Horford. In the fact that you know Al Horford's you know six ten, but won't grab you know eight <laughs> boards. Yeah. Um. But he but he does everything else so well. I think Turner is going to be in that where you know he's a, a worse defender, um, a, a worse rebounder, and a worse passer. But at least in that same vein, where he's going to be a five that can stretch it out and, and fit into the modern era. But if he's able to be more physical, then defensively you're going to be able to start the fast break a little bit more and having. Uh, you know, Oladipo having Evans, that's going to pick up the pace. And we saw last year, this was a team that was very slow. Around, yeah. I think, 23rd out of 30 uh, teams when it comes to pace. Very slow team, not really running up and down the floor. I think now adding guys like McDermott, who, weirdly enough, is pretty damn athletic and th- can throw it down on the, on the break. Absolutely. Oladipo clearly can. Uh, Reek can as well. Um, I think having those guys, and even TJ Leaf, TJ Leaf will be, um, you know, kind of... Uh, helped out with running the fast break because that's what he did so well at UCLA. He trails on those late threes too. Having the ability of Miles Turner to at least, you know, be able to box out, be more physical, grab boards, and then dish it out to an outlet and then start that fast break, that could be massive. I think he needs to take that next step if they do want to become, you know, again, get to the Eastern Conference Finals. I think they'll be able to make that. I think I think this team is probably the third best team in the East. Um, Bold. I think they're better than Boston. Uh, sorry, I don't think they're better than. Yeah. I don't think they're better than Boston. <laughs> I don't think they're better than Toronto. Um, and I think they're better than Philly, just because Philly is so young. And I didn't see enough out of them in the playoffs. Where we look at Indiana in the playoffs, they were fantastic and, and they got better. Yeah. And, and this is a team that was very well coached. Where Brett Brown is still kind of getting used to being a head. He coach, literally lost enough. them a game because he put Ben Simmons back in well, over the goal. And then even then, he, he lost him another game. Uh, because you, Brett, Brett Stevens has them inbounding on the uh, far oh sideline, and he just has El Horford wide open under the net because Brett Brown couldn't draw up a defense. <sighs> and and, and yeah. Philadelphia was so lackadaisical with the ball, they were not able to keep it with them. They kept turning the ball over in crucial moments yeah. again and again no, it's, and it's again. A super young team. And they lose more veteran leadership. The best players on their team you know, would help them win 16 straight was Bellinelli and Ursan. And both those guys are gone now. Uh, they replaced them with technically more well-rounded players, but not mm-hmm. better. Because I mean, Wilson Chandler is a good wing. He's, yeah. an, he's not he's not a better shooter, but he's a good wing. And then uh, B Jelly is, is good on the four. Uh, he's not a better shooter than Urson, though. Really, Urson's a better creator. Yeah, Urson's pretty good at driving, and, and, and at least he does more offensively for you. Yeah, um, Belly's a better shooter. Um, and then with Marco, Marco was just. Just he, I, I, I had crapped on Marco Bellinelli so much. The dude think, can the first run, time he did our rankings, but that guy running, was fantastic. His running shots are hilarious. Like he just sprints around on a curl and he's just like, whoo, nails it. And just off balance, like chuck it up, and it just looks smooth. And and he did that so efficiently yep. last year. Yep. Um, that, that's so not having <laughs> that. I think it's going to be huge. We'll um, see for for this Philly team. I, I think it's going to be effective. You know, we might we might have everything. a video before the season about are we overhyping the 76ers again because of their <laughs> success? Because no one expected them to win fifty three games. You know, no one expected them to be a third seed. So like we'll get into that later. But I think this this team has for me they're still in that second in that clear uh, second tier or second tier third well, tier. Well, I think I think we would third say tier with Milwaukee. If I was ranking teams, I would say. Boston's in really their own yes, tier when healthy. Hundred percent agree. So then two all stars. Then it would fall into I would say the second tier. Three all stars. Technically, Toronto, then uh, Toronto, then uh, Boston. No, sorry, then Toronto, Philly, then Indiana. I would put Indiana in that that second tier because they have everything established. I mean, they're bringing in players, but they have the coach established. They have their star established. We look at Milwaukee. Yes, they have the star, but who else is around? Uh, Giannis and who else? You know, can Bud be able to coach him, and can that team be effective? That's why I put them in that uh, that yeah, tier for a little me, bit it's, lower it's because then the, the Milwaukee and Washington are all right in that same like you're dangerous, but can you put it all well, together to beat me? And I think Washington's a fucking mess. They, like, I mean, you're, they're you're a bringing, hot mess, but they're you're talented. Bringing in Dwight, who you know he just wants to be a a, a, a me player, 
It's all about him. And, Put and, Dwight under the rim. Take and, him back to the Orlando and days. Bradley Beal's the same way, and so is John Wall. I mean, I love you Bradley have Beal. Three, you have three <laughs> alphas on that team. Yeah. Um, one of them shouldn't be an alpha, and Dwight yep. Howard. Um, I love Beal, and I love John Wall, and yep. those two work together, but I don't think they're going to have enough on that team to that really Santa be that Ransky, effective. That's Austin Rivers, Kelly Oubre. Love it, and Otto. Porter, like, I was about to say, where's Otto? Porter? Otto Porter, like that. That team, like I think, I think those three teams: Milwaukee, Indy, and uh, Mil- Milwaukee, Indy, and Washington are all in that in that second grouping. It's it's clearly Boston up one, and then it's the Toronto and uh, Philly, mm-hmm. and then it, to me, it's like everybody else is in that third group. I guess technically third yeah. group. I just think that again, Indy is going to be someone that's that's very. Very intriguing because we look at what they were able to do last year. Um, they were thirty-two and twenty against the East, but now you're, you know, Cleveland's going to take a step yeah, back. Yeah, say everybody gets um, wins over Cleveland now. Miami's most likely going to take a step back. We don't know how Toronto will do. Um, they're not going to win forty games again in the East. I don't think. Um, maybe they do against you know with Cleveland out. Um, but I, I think that you know this. None of the teams at the bottom took steps up, and I think Indiana's going to get more wins, climb up, and probably hit that fifty-win threshold. Um, and, and be Ooh. able to... Well, I mean, they, they were at 48 I know, last year. I know. So, I mean... If you're taking, adding talent, technically. We're but, adding talent, and you're taking away talent from Cleveland. So yeah. I think they're able to add two more wins, get to that 50-mark like th- threshold, and I think they're going to be a team that finishes in the top four in the East, probably match up against... I will say, this is how I'm thinking. If they go 4-8, you out. think what, like the Pistons get in on the back end? Uh, I'll, I'll give my early Eastern Conference yeah, predictions. Let's Why do not? Uh, number one, I'll have Boston. Um, I think they stay healthy. I think they, they finish out of top two. I'll put Toronto. Yep. Um, three, I will put Indiana. Four, I'll put Philly. Um, then I will put five. I will put the Bucks. Six, I'm going to put Washington. Seven, I'll put Miami. And then at eight, um, Cleveland, I think, falls out. And I will slot in the Charlotte Hornets at eight. Oh. You still have Kemba. You have Miles. Um, you have the moist one. The moist? I do love you it. You have Tony Parker now. Yeah, I had to talk about the Tony Parker so, edition. I think you're going to see... I said Boston won. Yeah, yep. Boston will match up against Philly in the second round. Toronto against uh, Indiana. I think Indiana wins that one. I'm all about building a fucking wall up in the north. Pistons are going to make it in that eighth seed. The eighth seed? Yep. The Pistons. Oh, I'm sorry. You said up north, so I assume no, Toronto. No, not, 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 not I the true north. Toronto. We got like north next door neighbors. Yeah, a little. Detroit is just, just a little northeast. bit. Northeast. It's Detroit's literally 10 feet from the border. Like you can just. Yeah. So I'm just saying. They're building the fucking wall. But they don't have Stamp anymore. It doesn't matter. The wall, you still have two giants on that team. I know Boban's not there. And I still want him, but. Well, they know. have Drummond and Blake. I yeah. don't know. I'm not, I'm not too high. Because they don't have a point guard. Trust and Reggie. Is it going to be Ish? <laughs> Trust and Reggie. Ish even still on that team anymore? Trust and Reggie. I don't know. Anyways, let us know what you think about the Pacers. <laughs> Do you Down think in they're the legit? Comments below. Do you think they're a, they're, a, they're a Eastern Conference finals contender? I think so. I truly think so. I actually think so. Sean, I think Sean this team the Kool-Aid. Be really good. Will you? Um, and, and one thing that it, they're going to improve on is they're going to be better at home. I mean, they were still pretty decent, twenty-seven and fourteen. Uh, that was same as Boston at home. I think they're going to be better at home. Um, and and I think this team's going to be really damn good. Um, yeah. And they they weren't even that good in the division as well. I mean, we look at the division; they're ten and six in the division. Um, and that's with Milwaukee, Detroit, and Chicago in there. They're going to win. They're going to be the top team in the Central for sure. And so. Because Cleveland's not going to be it. So I, th- I think they're going to end up uh, being uh, the, the top team in the Central. I like Indiana a lot. Let me know what you think uh, down in the comments below. Dave got, gave his opinion. I gave mine. I will hear Ricky's a little bit later. So yeah, if you like we'll this, get it. I mean, if you like the Summer League round, let us know as well. We'll continue that. Um, but we talked about Mellow. We talked about the Summer League. We talked about the Pacers. And now it's the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for helping support Most Valuable Podcast and supporting the Fast Break Podcast. We love doing this every single week. We've done three, I think, this week. Sunday, uh, yeah. then Monday, I think it was, or Monday or Tuesday. It's like Saturday, um, Monday, Tuesday, and then today. Yeah, so It all blurs together, but I love doing it. A long week, and we appreciate all the views. We appreciate all the support. Again, don't forget to check out patreon.com slash podcast if you want to be on the Fast Break or any of our other podcasts. Don't forget to rate us five stars on iTunes if you have the time. Also, check out Most Valuable Podcast so you don't miss any segments or full podcasts. And also, you can buy a shirt on mostvalopodcast.com if you are so inclined to do so. But for Dave Oster, I'm Sean Anderson. We'll see you next time.